Hi everybody, welcome to Books Up Close. My name is Chris Lloyd, I hope you're doing well. These are all of the books I read in August. I actually had a quiet August reading month. I don't know why, I don't know what happened, but less books than usual, not a problem. Of course, just interesting to like chart month to month what my reading habits are. So one of the books I read is another little check of my reading intentions for this year. I wanted to read two Victorian novels, if you remember that video. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. I'll link it at the end or down below or somewhere. You can find it easily. And I already read The Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. And I do want to read another Hardy if I can by the end of the year, but maybe I won't. But this time I read Hard Times by Charles Dickens. Um, I'd not read this one before. At university I did a Victorians course, this is a little side point, and that was, it was across the year, so it was like 20 weeks. We read a lot of books, a lot of long books too. I could never put these on a reading list now, they're, they're just way too long. We read Bleak House, which is like a thousand pages, we read Middlemarch, we read Return of the Native, we read The Moonstone, we read Villette, we read In Memoriam, we read... There was something else that was also quite long. There's at least six chunky 400 page plus books. Not quite sure how we did it. I'm not even sure if I read every page of all of the things. I don't think it was just too intense alongside all the other modules. But anyway, Bleak House was my kind of first Dickens and then moved in from there to like the Christmas books which I've been reading every year for the past couple of years, which have been really lovely um, during the festive season. And then I read Great Expectations a couple of years ago. Loved that. And now I've sent a Hard Times, it's one of his shorter books, it's actually like under 300 pages and it's set in the north rather than in London which is quite interesting which is why I wanted to read it and it's set in a place called Coketown so this is like a, a made-up name I'm assuming, <laughs> I don't think it was a Coketown uh, but he went to Lancashire just before writing this to Preston I think and Dickens is, you know, he's always doing this in London, right? He's writing about the city and industrialization and how that's kind of reshaping people in a kind of negative way. And he goes up north and he sees this kind of rapid industrialization and he wants to write a book about it. So again, like most of Dickens' stuff, it's quite moralistic in tone. It's quite heavy handed in a lot of places, but like that's his thing, that was his style. That's the kind of readership. He was after, this book is like, it's quite, quick in that way because it's a shorter book and he's got one main point that he wants to make and the kind of central character is a guy called Thomas Gradgrind again one of those Dickens names where the name is telling you a lot right this kind of grinding work is at the heart of what he wants he has no time for kind of foolishness for fancy for airs for intellect even he raises his kids to like never desire things or want things that they should just you know, they should work and they should be happy with things and they don't want to think about anything. It's very like capitalism is the way, right? Like is, is the kind of the, or the early version of capitalism as the revolution is taking off. And obviously that doesn't work for anyone, right? People get mixed up with one another. You've got this cast of characters who all kind of butt up against each other's lives. And we realise by the end, that this kind of, this model of only thinking, not feeling doesn't work. It's a very evocative book, right? It really paints this coat town really well. The kind of, the way the soot and the smoke has kind of seeped into like the bricks and the buildings. It's a really evocative book. It's easy to read, it's kind of fun. It's maybe not his, my favourite of the things I've read of Dickens. It doesn't have like maybe the scope of the longer books and it doesn't have as punchy characters as some others, but it's definitely worth a read if you're interested in Dickens' stuff, and especially if you want a kind of non-London centric version of Dickens, it's quite interesting to look at. Or if you're interested in that period of time, I think this is a useful way in. So yeah, I recommend it, but probably not the favourite thing I've read of his. So that was one of the intentions I have done this year. I'm quite happy with myself that I did that, and I will keep on it. I've got Wuthering Heights ready to go again for when it gets rainy and windy and cold, which given it's the UK, it could be any minute. But that's for the rest of the year. We've still got a few months left. I'll come to the really good books at the end. The ones I enjoyed also include Paul by Daisy Lafarge. Now, Daisy Lafarge is a poet and now a novelist. This is her first novel. And this one is about a young student called Francis who takes off to rural France after something goes down in 
Paris where she was studying with her boyfriend slash he was her supervisor. The details are murky for quite a lot of the book. You don't find out really what happened, why she's fleeing, what's going on, but something happened. But again, she's in her young 20s and you kind of forget that for a while and then it comes back to like, oh yeah, she's actually quite young in this book because her voice is very assured. It's really beautifully written, this book, and you kind of just live in her mind and she's really descriptive, telling you what happens minute by minute. But there are so many kind of gaps and absences which the book is really playing with about like not telling us this and not quite telling us this. So basically she goes to rural France to work on this kind of eco farm that this guy called Paul runs, the eponymous Paul. And he's this older guy, he's interested in like the land and she goes into his world, right? So she meets his friends and immediately there is this kind of spark connection thing between them. And she's really not sure what that is. And she's like, do I even like him? But he is immediately smitten with her. And as the book unfolds, and each chapter is a day of the week, so it's like lundi, mardi, mercredi, and so on. She gets more and more entangled in his life. Eventually she goes and works on another farm at some point, because that was always her plan, and then kind of returns, I won't spoil anything, but she kind of returns back to Paul at some point. And it's really beautiful. If anything, like the book is beautiful at describing these rural French landscapes. You really get a sense of place and sensation and atmosphere and food and, and the weather and all of these things. There's some really beautiful dialogue in it. She's really good at conjuring. Lafarge is, is really good at conjuring these relationships, these strange new friendships that kind of build over a day or so. What I would say is that I wasn't, I was in it, but I wasn't like fully charging ahead, right? I wasn't like desperate to know what happened next, even though it was tense at places. I was like, where is this gonna go? The revelation of what did happen with Francis and this other guy is a really interesting revelation. It wasn't at all what I expected. That was quite an interesting moment. Still not sure what I think about that. And there is a kind of final reveal about Paul that again, I'm not gonna spoil, but kind of is there all along, I guess. It's a very fascinating ending, but we also kind of find out that the character of Paul is based on another Paul, a real, historical artist Paul. Again, I'm not gonna say too much about that, but it did make me think of Cusk's recent book that we talked about, as well as uh, The Second Place, which I reviewed a long time ago, in which Cusk is using these kind of real painters in a more kind of, kind of contemporary setting and thinking through their work. So that there's an interesting correlation between those two books and what they're doing. So yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting novel. Did I love it? Probably not, but I was fascinated by it. I don't think I'll reread it, but there was enough interest in there to kind of get me to the end and left me with lots of questions. So I guess that's a win in some kind of way, right? But yeah, that was Paul by Daisy Lafarge. Let me know if you've read it. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. The other interesting book that I'd read, and I've been reading this very slowly, I started it a very long time ago, is called um, Disorganisation and Sex by Jameson Webster. I love the cover for one thing. Um, and I heard her on, I don't know, the Lab Radio Hour podcast, I think, probably, talking about this book. And basically it's a collection of essays by her about sexuality. She's a psychoanalyst, I should say. She's a psychoanalyst writer. And these are all books about the kind of disorganising power of sex and sex writ large as kind of sexuality and all of our internal drives and so on. And as you start reading it, the kind of essays are very different. But when you get to the end, if you look at the notes, like they were published in a wide variety of places for this, some like academic, very academic journals, some kind of like public facing things. So it accounts for the differences in the essays. And I guess that could be either a positive or a negative, depending on how you feel about these kinds of books, that some of them feel in such a different register from the one before that it's quite hard to move from one to the next, which is why I left space in between them basically and it took me a while to get there. Some of them are really fascinating. Some of them are written in a very high style that I found some parts difficult. I'm like, I don't know this obscure Freud essay, so I kind of need more of a way in. But some of them are very engaging, quick, even funny. She has turns of phrase that I really like. She's not the kind of Adam Phillips style of psychoanalytic thinker. We've talked about him before on these videos where he's really writing in a kind of philosophical tradition almost or kind of literary criticism tradition where he's thinking very carefully about his sentences and kind of 
weighing up all these alternatives within the clauses this is way more kind of pithy almost aphoristic quite just like very beautiful sentences but very cryptic at the same time and you kind of have to read them a few times but yeah there's some really interesting stuff in here there's a great essay called end your analysis <laughs> um which is like really thinking through about what psychoanalysis is and what it's for and it's written by a psychoanalyst so that's interesting in of itself there's stuff about dreams the death drive loneliness um all kinds of things in here that if you are interested in psychoanalysis, if you're interested in gender and sexuality and all of those things, you will find something in here of interest to you, I'm sure. But if you're not interested in psychoanalysis, you probably wouldn't love this book. You might not get much from this book because it's quite in the weeds in places about kind of psychoanalytic history, about certain case studies, about certain trajectories of like Freudian Lacanian thought and so on. So yeah, I wouldn't recommend it to just any old person who's interested in reading about sexuality. But if you're in that mode, go for it. I think you might find it fun. I also read some other non-fiction. I read A Song For You, My Life with Whitney Houston by Robin Crawford. So this is a memoir that my friend Jack gave me to read because he knows I love Whitney, he loves Whitney, and he thought I'd like this. And if you know anything about Whitney's life and Robin's life, like they were super, super close, right? They were inseparable. Robin was her like helper, PA, emotional support, all of the things for like most of her life. And this book is Robin's take on their story and how it went from them kind of meeting as kind of like young teenagers right through to the point where Robin is shut out of Whitney's life because of Bobby Brown, because of the drugs, because of Whitney's mum, because of all kinds of things. And then her going on to kind of live her own life outside of the music business and finding a wife and all of these lovely things. It's a lovely ending to the book for Robin. It's a really, it's like quite well written. Um, there are some lovely passages. There are some repetitive passages that I was like, oh, I wish you had a better editor because I think it would have crisped up some of the sections. But it's very straightforward, direct, doesn't mess around. It kind of tells you very early on the book that Robin and Whitney were lovers for a moment when they were like young and then that stopped because you know there's been rumours throughout their career right Whitney's mum hated the fact that these rumours were circulating right she was a strong Christian she had a very clear idea of what Whitney's public image would be and you really get a sense of this kind of larger cast of characters around Whitney so like her mum and dad both of whom had their flaws you've got these kind of friends you've got Bobby Brown you've got the kind of other kind of cousins and hangers-on and like Robin's own siblings and mum. Like there's a lot of people in this book that really kind of flesh out the story around Whitney that you might not know. Like even if you've watched those recent documentaries and films, this book is like a beautiful way in because it's told from Robin's kind of on the ground experience. So if you're interested at all in Whitney, I would strongly recommend you read it. I'm not sure if it's actually been published in the UK, like this is a US version. So you might have to find a way to get it but I highly recommend reading. I'm a huge Whitney fan so this was huge to me and I definitely did not cry. Um, I obviously did. It's great. But then let's do another non-fiction while we're here. So I read A Girl's Story by Annie L. No. Like you know I'm working through all of the Fitzcrowler versions of Erno's work. I've got one more actually to read called Happening. I'm not sure how I missed that. I don't have it in the little uh, no section here on the shelf. So I need to get it happening before the new one comes out, I think, in November, maybe. It was called The Use of Photography. Anyway, A Girl's Story is, I think, is one of her best, actually, reading this. It's about this early, early period of her life in which she goes off to camp and she kind of learns about sexuality, right, as a, as a young girl. The first half of the book is fascinating because basically Erno is saying... Like, I don't know who this girl is, so I'm going to write about it in the third person. I'm not going to say I, me, I'm going to say she, Annie. And that in its own is already a wonderful move for someone who is so interested in the kind of blurry boundaries between memoir and fiction and biography and all of those kind of things. Right, I've said this before that I know is way more playful than I think a lot of maybe critics or like publishers give her credit for. Like, this, this is... In Fitzcarraldo terms, white covers means 
like non-fiction, it means memoir, it means essay. Whereas so many of her books have kind of tread a really interesting line between what does it mean to retell the past, right? What does it mean to write a memoir, to reconstruct a history that you don't fully remember or you have a strange relationship to or whatever. And this book is a really good example of that where she's like, I don't understand this period of time, so I'm not gonna try and write it from within. I'm not gonna try and kind of retrospectively paste emotions onto that person that I don't quite know. Rather, I'm just gonna describe and I'm just gonna tell you what happened and I'm gonna insinuate and I'm gonna suggest possible options, but do I know what's going on? Hi, Fred, or not? And that is a fascinating move. And then kind of part of the way through, she catches up to what she feels. And she's like, actually, I do know this person now. I do know where we are. And it switches and it's utterly fascinating. I think it's brilliant as ever. Annie really in my eyes doesn't do much wrong. So um, I highly recommend this book if you've not read her before. Maybe down the road, I'm gonna do a whole I know, video once I've read all of the ones that are available to me and maybe do a kind of little overview or summary or something. But for now, highly recommend this one. And finally, the other book that I read this month is, ooh, it was too close, Confessions of the Fox by Geordie Rosenberg. And Freddie is sat right here. Um, he wants to be part of the video. So this book is, I'm reading it for um, work purposes. And I'd always wanted to read it. It was on my shelf. I hadn't read it. So I was like, okay, now I have to read it. So here's my good opportunity. Rosenberg himself is an academic and this book plays on lots of kind of academic tropes so the opening is like this preface where it's like I've gone into hiding you don't know where I am but the manuscript you're about to read is a kind of a real thing and I verified it blah 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 and it follows the story of a guy called Jack Shepherd in 18th century London so Jack Shepherd was a real figure he's written about by various other people there was a kind of maybe biography that floated around that people said was ghostwritten by Daniel Defoe, but like, who knows? As a figure, he appears in lots of other kind of books in the period, but he is this 18th century renowned thief, vagabond kind of figure. In Rosenberg's hands, this story becomes something totally amazing. So the book is fascinating because we're reading this manuscript about Shepard. It's written in the third person, as we're reading, we then get these footnotes from the academic themselves, Dr. Voth, who I'm saying they because the gender isn't always clear and that, and I'll tell you in a minute why this makes some sense. But basically as the manuscript goes on, these footnotes kind of explain words we might not know, little bits of history, but then the narrator, this academic starts giving parts of their life, right? So we get their biography is kind of spilling into the footnotes. We understand about their history. We understand that they kind of like are kind of pushed out of the university that is becoming more bureaucratized and uh, kind of cracking down on any kind of interesting intellectual thought. Those of you that work in a university like me <laughs> might recognize this, right? But the bureaucratized, institutionalized version of education is kind of seeping into these footnotes as they're editing the manuscript. So it's fascinating because we're getting like two stories for the price of one, really. And as the book unfolds, it's kind of revealed this much larger history, right, of empire, of kind of global networks that we know existed in the 18th century, but maybe aren't always there in the text of that period. But we're really getting a much more fleshed out version of the past, so much so that the academic is like, read this journal article, read this book by Saidiya Hartman or whoever, right, like real academic figures. Um, the big kind of change twist is that Jack Shepard is a trans man, right, in this storyline as much as the word trans man or the, the phrase trans man makes sense in that historical period but what the academic is doing is kind of showing a different version of the shepherd history and kind of mining that real life story for kind of traces of deviance of and deviance in a very kind of like queer sense right of non-normativity of resisting norms of, of play and that fits very clearly with the 18th century, right? And especially with 18th century literature, which is so full of bodies and extremity and strangeness and literary play as well, right? The kind of big books of that era, like Defoe is inventing this kind of first person novel. Um, you've got Lawrence Stern just before it, making a novel where like nothing happens, right? Like you've got real literary experimentation here where the forms that we know now, the novel, for instance, are still fluid and kind of coming into being. 
So alongside that, we're understanding what identity is, who humans are, right? This is the period where the novel and the individual are kind of coming together, if you like. So I think Rosenberg is really, really clever for tying those two things together and making this also a story about queerness, sexuality, race, and so many other kind of issues that a lot of people would say like, oh, these are contemporary issues, right? You're kind of like anachronistically placing them in the past, but like, no, no, they were always there, just maybe in a different, la they weren't called that, right? A different language was used to describe them. I think this is fantastic. I flew through it. It's a brilliant book. The ending is fascinating. Yeah, I flew through the pages, both wanting more of the shepherd story and more of the footnoted academic story. It's entirely my thing, like this is my thing. Um, kind of like postmodern, but not really reflective novel that's doing multiple things at once, that's about the history of gender. I'm in. I think you'll like it if you haven't read it. I highly, highly, highly recommend it. So those are the books I've read this month. I would love to hear what you've been reading this month, what you wanna read next month. And yeah, let's get into the comments and talk about some of these things. And as ever, please like the video please always like the videos. And if you want to go back and like all the other videos, that'd be really helpful. Please subscribe if you haven't already. I know I ask you to do this all the time, but please subscribe, click the bell for notifications, and then share this with people and comment below. So until next month, I'll see you soon. Stay well, stay healthy, look after each other, and keep reading. Bye.